Welcome to the fourth Angry Cow Poetry in the Rialto Living Room. Pleasure to have all of you here. When uh, COVID first hit, I started doing this online poetry event where we had so many cool poets that I knew and I was part of some different gatherings and we all shut down, everything shut down with COVID. And I started gathering, like, what can I do? How can I go through this world that's now become digital suddenly? And I started doing this project where I collected different poets' videos and I made a collection, I put it out there, called Outdoor Voices and Indoor World. And I knew a lot of really cool poets to start with, and I started finding others and looking for others. And I think through Cortez Harris had posted this video by Raja Bell Freeman of Hounds. And I think you wrote that when you were 19. Um, <laughs> 18, <laughs> Roger Hound, and I listened to it, it was one of the best pieces I've ever heard, it was amazing. And so I googled and found another piece, I found uh, Never Have I Ever, and the quality didn't drop, the quality was every bit as good as the first piece that had already blown me away, and I reached out, reached out to Roger and told her about the project I was doing, asked if you'd be part of it, and thankfully she said yes, and she submitted a piece called Boomerangs, which again, the quality didn't drop, and everything I've heard from Roger has been amazing, I've heard had the pleasure to hear her many times now, uh, both live and through video. And she is fantastic. I'm excited to be able to bring her here. She is a teacher. She teaches uh, writing poetry with, especially youth, with 12 literary arts in the past and now lit Literary Cleveland. Is that lit correct? Lit Cleveland. And also Lit Cleveland. Lit, lit Cleveland. What's that part? This, the, the, the conference. This week. Oh, you're just the conference this week is Lake Cleveland. Right. And what's the name of the group you teach normally for now? Lake Erie Inc. I'm sorry, I should have known that. Lake Erie Inc. Right. So anyway, she's an amazing poet. She's a fantastic teacher. Uh, it's a, my pleasure to welcome the stage, Raja Bell Freeman. These poems I'm going to start with. Do you guys know about the um, the coronavirus pandemic? <laughs> I think got a beer in it, so <laughs> Does anyone um, possibly maybe live through that? No? <laughs> None of you? No, we died. It's our spirit. When the pandemic started, I was in college. I was in my college advanced poetry writing class, not to flex or anything, but it was advanced poetry writing. <laughs> and we had um we had a poem due every week and I'm like why would I want to write a poem every week right now there's a pandemic and why would you make me do this right so I was like almost as like a form of protest to having to do poems every week while there was like the serious unprecedented crisis I started calling all of my poems crisis writing so I was like I'm not putting any effort into these titles so then I ended up with like crisis writing number one, number two, number three, number four. And I want to start today off with crisis writing number five. So crisis writing number five. I've been saying I'd be dead within the next five years for about three years now. Which must mean I'm almost done. Because obviously everything we say is true. And since everything we say is true, and I started my five-year walk of death three years ago, I'm at about the halfway point on my death journey, or walk, or trail, or whatever you want to call it. Am I half dead or half alive? Is the glass half empty or half full? Do you know that calling a, half, a glass half full isn't going to give you any more water? Why bite off more than you can chew? Why live a life more than you can? I'm standing on the thin line between living and dying, half in, half out, twirling on my tippy toes in circles so both sides of me can feel alive, and both my eyes can see death, and the line can get blurrier and blurrier. Before I do this next one, do you guys mind if I say bad words? <laughs> Go right ahead. Over it. <laughs> <laughs> Crisis writing number 18. Ode to the broken windows in my house. You persistent little fucks. You hope 
humbling reminder of our stumbling moments. The fly swatter that was swatted too hard. The arm that crushed through you when someone's foot took a sleigh ride on a sock. The duct tape we never bought to cope how embarrassingly immodest you are. Why are there so many of you? Waiting to see how long it will take for someone to peck the hazardous spikes of you from the tile floor is my favorite experiment. You're everywhere. This is your home now. Rain over me, you bursted little aperture. You're like a portal to everything I've ever wanted. And yet I can't climb through without stripping my skin, thin layer by thin layer, down to my blood. I want to pass through you so bad. I want to be you. Want to feel both sides of the world passing through the wounds in me. I want to be cracked open like you. Want to be feared. Want people to be afraid to walk over the broken pieces of me. Want the parts of myself I've shed to be strong enough to pierce the blood from anyone who dares to try to walk over me. I want to rule over someone the way you do. I want your strength. <laughs> I was, like, pausing, because I wasn't positive you were done. Like, how does that pull men? I don't remember. For, for future reference, I tend to take long pauses at the end of my poem. <laughs> and then I read the title of the next one. It's, we it's weird. I know. It's crazy. Crisis writing number eight. The last time I was as scared as this. I was miles from home in a hotel in the South. And a headline told me that a man had been lynched in a park a block away. And a white girl said to me, but this is kind of cool, you know, like, wow, we're really living through history right now. When the pandemic started, I thought of her, because I think I know now what she was feeling. Like an awful thing was affecting her, but probably wouldn't actually kill her. I wish I could have felt it when we were in that hotel. The feeling of knowing that I would get to live through history. Of being confident that the worst of things had passed, even if it was ignorant. I wish I could feel that now. Our hotel was on lockdown just like the country is now. Here I am again in disaster. Heart beating through history because I keep telling it to. Knowing I'll live through the virus, but this time is different. This is a hydra of a crisis. It seems with every mask scattered on I-90, two black bodies drop on camera. America has been growing ugly crisis head after ugly crisis head for as long as she's been. We've had her in quarantine so long we almost forgot that red blood, white skin, and blue uniform are her three favorite Crayola crayons. Americans are dying by virus by the thousands. Black Americans are dying by crushed windpipes, bullet holes, and by virus by the thousands even more. How many national pandemics can America fit in her pocket? How many can she swallow like candy? How many can she dismiss at a time? And how many will make the news today? This next part is um. It's not warm pause. I be I be forgetting I be forgetting the like about claps. You know what I mean? Like it just feels like I'm supposed to like it feels like I'm monologuing. <laughs> <laughs> this um next part. So the poem I just read, Crisis Writing Number Eight. There was this point after um, when all these protests in 2020 were happening. And I had a number of white friends that I hadn't talked to in a really long time reach out to me and ask if I was all right. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, the protest, Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, well, yes, but what? <laughs> of the poem I just did. I was like, you know what? This is how I feel. I'm not even answering your questions. Um, so this next piece. Is the ceiling barking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's applause from last piece. Yeah, right. <laughs> the sailing enjoyed it. The pause was too long. <laughs> and white friend asked if I'm going to the protest. Says she feels it's her duty to drive me there if I want to go. Says she knows I don't have a car. Says she understands when I tell her I'm sitting this out. Says she's here for me. Says she'll be at the protest for me. I thought she was going for George Floyd. Says let me know if you need anything. Ask if I'm okay. I do not have an answer to this question. I respond with a screenshot of a poem. She says it's accurate. Says it's spot on. Says she understands. Says I'm a great writer. Quotes her favorite line back to me. I did not need this validation. Crisis writing number 24. Sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll wait for you guys next. Next time, I'm gonna pause. <laughs> I'm gonna pause, and you're gonna start clapping, and it's gonna make so much sense. I'm gonna like, wait. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, crisis writing number 24. Patrick Warren is shot and killed outside his home on January 14th, 2021, after yet another wellness check gone wrong. Everything I've seen since I saw the video of his last moments alive has existed through a lens of his murder. In other words, I don't understand how things exist as if this had never happened and I fail to understand it every time. I replay life in my head disgusted at how it all fails to gel together. My dreams are clips of reality in montage. Get down, says the officer. Rise up, says Amanda Gorman six days later. Be the light, says Gorman. Lighten the skin, says America, since America has said much of anything at all. Children are the future, says the world. You're acting like a child, says yet another officer. I am a child, says nine-year-old girl handcuffed and pepper sprayed. How could catastrophe possibly prevail over us, ask Gorman. By blunt force and power, says I, actually paying attention. Pay attention. I'm not here to give you hope. I'm here to tell you what the fuck you should be hopeful for. See, I did it that time. <laughs> We're really proud. Trust the store. Trust the store. <laughs> Crisis writing number 25, February 7th. The only Facebook friend of mine that had a birthday today has been dead since July, June maybe. I was genuinely saddened by her passing. I didn't know the woman, didn't even know her to be dead until long after the fact. No one I've known that has died in the past year has died of coronavirus. I find that strange. Maybe it is a hoax then. Maybe the so-called coronavirus death toll was really just the number of times I think about a dead person a day. I didn't even know these people. Maybe the thing troubling me is I never will. What's the word for grieving the loss of someone that wouldn't have grieved if you died? What's the word for grieving the loss of someone you only met once? What's the word for grieving the loss of someone you didn't even like? What's the word for grieving the loss of someone you've wished were dead? Grief is the most bullshit mental acrobatics I've ever done. There's no point. I want to stop. The world is death. This year is death. The dirt under my nails is death. Breath is grief. Every time I blink is grief. You may be the lucky winner. Check under your seat. It's grief. The air is death. The walls are closing in and they too are death. That thumping heart of yours, contrary to popular belief, is beating you to death. The only Facebook friend of mine that had a birthday today has been dead since July, June maybe. It's Sandra Bland's birthday too. What an inevitable coincidence. Two women I can't stop thinking about because they're dead came to life on the same day. I don't know these women. Maybe the thing troubling me is I never will. Maybe I know them all too well. And maybe their names are dead. Mm. 
You said do two sets, right? Mm -hmm. You said do one set and then leave and then come back and do more poems with a different set, like different, like don't do the same poems twice. Preferably, yeah. Yeah. You got plenty of poems. Yeah. Um, Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you do you, but yeah, that was the intention. <laughs> it was not just to repeat the first set later. <laughs> In case Danielle missed something. <laughs> do your thing. And you can probably wing it. I can totally, I'm going to improvise. No, okay, I'm not going to do that. So I think this next one that I'm about to do is going to be my last one for this set, and I'm going to come back and do more of them. Probably in not that much time from now. So, I hope you guys don't hate me. Because <laughs> I will be back here. Um, not much. So, this is. That's <laughs> another poem. <laughs> oh my gosh. This next one I think is going to be my last. Yeah. 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 See, that makes sense. This, this is going to be the last crisis writing I do tonight. Okay, so a little backstory with this one. I had this friend, okay, I'm gonna, I am need to stop having white friends, no offense. <laughs> you always step outside. <laughs> I had this, <laughs> oh my God, I had this friend and she sends me this video um, you know this video of this girl, and she's on skates, right? And she's on Black Lives Matter Avenue. You know, they painted Black Lives Matter on that street in Washington. I don't know. It's called Black Lives Matter Avenue now. I don't know what it was before. And she's, like, skating across it, and, like, Andre Day is playing that Rise Up song. And she's like, yes, freedom is here. And <laughs> great, yay, finally. And my friend, she sent it to me, and she was like, oh my god, I just love black people. And I was like, what? She's like, I just love black people. <laughs> so this is crisis writing number 27. <laughs> Don't so, stop having white friends. <laughs> it's also called, I love black people. <laughs> They love how candles smell when they're burning. Find some sick, excited peace in watching the body of the candle droop down under the weight of itself. They love candles. See, when they're burned, their scents are so strong and their light is so illuminating. Watching the flame flick over the wick is so exciting. There's nothing better than the way the flame beats at the candle, right? Leaves no choice but to soften, liquefy, bend over, surrender. You love candles. You could breathe in the smoke of their burning bodies all day. You love candles. In fact, I've seen you weeping over a candle burning out for the last time. A puddle, a burning nub of a wick. So sad seeing a candle gone, but not sad enough to reach down and try to snuff out the flame. In fact, the flame is what made it so beautiful in the first place, right? You love candles, so you buy another, and you light another, and another, and you consume, and consume, and consume, and we burn, and we melt, and we burn, and we melt, and we burn, and we melt, and repeat. I have seven candles in my home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, for the open mic, I'll start it off, and I'll do two pieces for you. This first piece is a contrapuntal, and for those not familiar, I learned this from Patrick Roche when Patrick put out his <laughs> but he did videos, and I'm like, what is that? I need to write one of those. So a contrapuntal is written in two columns, and you read the first column first as its own piece, the second column is the second piece, and then you read across to perform the third. So this is called Statues Teaching History. Statues. Marbleized on top of a horse, plaques of honor engraved, basking in sunlight, Perched on a pedestal, casting shadows, 
hiding in darkness the lingering bird shit, an undiscussed atrocity for all, the promised shine that never seems to come, another disappointment, another day, teaching history. The ghost of history, pale white faces, gallantly saving the day. The usual names in our young minds, heroes proudly built impossibly high over all below them. The reality of America's proclamations with freedom preached loudly each day. Another lesson read with fanfare in an American history classroom. Statues teaching history. The ghost of history marbleized pale white faces on top of a horse gallantly saving the day. Plaques of honor, the usual names engraved in our young minds, basking in sunlight, heroes proudly perched on a pedestal built impossibly high, casting shadows over all below them, hiding in darkness the reality of the lingering bird shit. America's proclamations, an undiscussed atrocity with freedom for all preached loudly, the promise shine each day that never seems to come. Another lesson, another disappointment read with fanfare, another day in an American history classroom. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. I'll do one more for you. So Akeem, who's going to come up next, Akeem was teaching a class of, on persona writing. Akeem is also a poetry teacher. And I took this class from Akeem. And we wrote a poem during the session, which is not what I'm reading today. I still have that somewhere. Um, but I wrote a poem that night. I actually liked it. I mean, for like on-the-spot writing. And then I wrote one not long after that, just in, in the basket and in what we talked about, what we learned. And a friend of mine, one of my good buddies from college, had recently posted a video of his daughter when she was way younger. And she was running around singing to her heart's content and dancing. Like, it didn't matter who was watching. And I remember, like, my kids did that. I, you know, did that before my memory probably. But, you know, enough time where you didn't have the self-consciousness. You weren't there, like, thinking, oh, what's this going to look like? What's going to sound like if I sing? And so now, like, I you know I look the words because people sing way better than I do. <laughs> so I just listen to others. Um, so this is on the tale of all of that. It's called An Unread Note to Self. Look at us dancing with gleeful abandon as the tape of your childhood plays. Your dance unreserved no matter who was watching. We were partners, companions. Now you step in front of a mirror and you no longer see me. You only see flaws, imperfections, never beauty. The mirror never bringing a smile. The world told you you didn't deserve me. You couldn't have me. That self-confidence was only for others. That whatever you were, it wasn't enough. The echoes still play in your mind every time you tamper your joy. You shouldn't dance, you're embarrassing. You can't sing, just mouth the words. Save the world from your shame, your inadequacy. But I remember when we danced. So next up to the stage, another of my very favorite poets, uh, who I met actually somewhere along the line virtually, I met you for, we met in person, um, a lot too long after Raja, and um, an amazing poet, and Akeem might be filling up a drink first, <laughs> but he's done lots of awesome things, I heard several of them online and connected, and then I think Raja asked me to be a judge at, I know you asked me just on the timeline, you asked me to judge for a slam. And I came in for that, and Akeem was there, and it's just kind of, I'd met Akeem at that point in time, because when I came in, Akeem was like, Keith! So, like, I know that wasn't the first time, but it was still really early on after I met Akeem. Oh, I almost forgot about that. Yeah, I don't even remember what that, it wasn't listen yet, no, it was something else. No, it was else. like one mic open, okay. I think, oh my god. Yeah. So, I know we connected there, and then Akeem was running um, these... Poetry Slams, this Listen Community, which was amazing, and I got to be, you know, an audience member virtually for many of those. That was the fourth slam I started. That was the fourth. <laughs> so, uh, certainly a treasure in the community. Please welcome the stage, Akeem Rollins. Yeah. No, let it sing. <laughs> Did you hear the poem? <laughs> Is that judgment? Hope not. <laughs> so I've written a lot of things in the past uh, month and some change. A whole lot of new things. 
Um, so I'll read this one, and I don't know. I might read another. I haven't read on a mic in a little bit, so I don't know how it feels, but we'll see. This is called How to Make a Day After. Crack the egg across the horizon. Make sure the white spreads like rays. The horizon will hold it. Push the crust into the mantle to toast. Earth has been here many times. She can take it. She's made to. Spread the sun across the earth and take a bite. Add salt, perhaps from your own eyes. Grief makes incredible seasoning. Know that everyone will bring everything to you except your mother back. They cannot go where she went and ever hope to return. Everyone, for a while, will not be enough. Everyone, for a while, will not have the right fit. Every hug will be two arms too short. This will not last because you are still here and you will move because everything she left, she left with you. You are the best she left. It may take an entire life of sunrises spread across your stove top. You may want to rip open the earth in hopes she is waiting there. Don't. The flowers did nothing to earn your angry, grieving hands. Everything that had a home before still has a home now. I know, I know, I know. I know, you don't, you can't. No one knows how to grieve in someone else's body. That's fine. Mm. All right, I'll do one that's a little bit current for me. I haven't really read these back as much, so I'm really just reading you drafts, so. <laughs> Um, but uh, a lot has happened to me in the past couple of months, and this is one of the poems I wrote that's kind of about that. Good stuff, good stuff. On Becoming. A wise sage once said, it hurts to become, I get that now. The ache is in the breaking of what once was comfort, now a bed of lice. Stillness, now movement, stone, now wind. If there is a God, they have changed. It is unholy to remain inert. Nothing about the orchestra of humans stays still. The heart drums, the lips hum, every cell constantly dances, nerves, maracas, eyelids, castanets, violin string hair and bass guitarries, voice of piano chords. To be is to be divine music. To crease while the bagpipes still inflate is abomination. There is a choir in my stomach that only sings my name. Gravity is a god hand that pulls me back home when I find the edge of the earth and threaten to break every trombone in my body. There is no jump if you are not moving in the first place. I broke the stillness. And every fiber ached a hallelujah so loud. My mama's God said it as his alarm to get started. Everything, everything comfortable hurt. Called me to float to elsewhere. Lost me at sea, an unmoving plank. But the sound of the waves, cymbals crashing, begging me to re-enter my body like an open mouth scream in a nightmare. I mistook for a dream and I fought myself the whole way to healing because health looks like harm to those who have only known pain. Freedom looks carceral when life is encaged in fear. Responsibility does feel like blame when every lens is set to shame. I had to relearn my name and now I know it. I know it to be the first word in the holy book of my life. I fought thunder and strife, lightning and fire, suicidal desire. I decided to choose myself every day, every day. There is a fresh sun waiting for my hello. Every day I send their light back to them. I call myself beautiful every day out of vanity and indulgence. 
out of delicious luxury and still being able to write my own chapters and verses. I am alive and that means I am holy. I stay and that means I can move still. I was buried in the grave of depression and decided to take a deep breath smell the roses growing above me and decided they had gotten enough of my blood liquor drunken them to growth. I want to grow and smell myself this time. I dug out, but not alone. There was love there the whole time, not waiting on the surface for my return, but deep underground with me where I was. Sometimes I mistook love for groundwater and watched it sink deeper into the earth, leaving me dry and thirsty. Now I know love is a solid action verb, not a slippery object noun. Love was the soil, the worms, the muck and messiness of becoming. All the love in my life starts with a king. Sometimes the best becoming is just going back home. Home is here. I am not at home. I am home. Everybody pauses before they return to the stage to check out the driver. <laughs> so Danielle Nicole Nikki Dixon is outside. She's an amazing poet. Uh, if we don't get to catch her on stage tonight, she was our first speech when we started this back in June, and all of those are online. So if you want to catch Raja again, and bits of Akeem and bits of me today, those are all will be available probably by the end of the weekend. But they're all at angrycowpoetry.com and then go to events or go to shows or it's angrycowpoetry.com slash Rialto if you want the, that's not going to come up as one of the options, but if you type that in, then I'll get you here as well. So we're going to bring to the stage one more time our fantastic feature. She's a poet, she plays flute, she draws, she paints, she's got all kinds of artistic talent. And we're going to hear one more time from Raja Bell Freeman. You might get a balloon out of this. Picture. Oh, I'm taking that balloon. Unless you, do you want the balloon? You sure? He doesn't want the balloon. Not for knowing how excited you are about the balloon. <laughs> I have to ask. So, um, this poem that I wrote in high school is one of the poems that you like read it, and then you can like read it backwards. And it's like, I don't know, like really cool because I wrote it. Um, what is the title? It's, the title is How I Feel About You. Do I have it actually pulled up on my screen? No. Might I forget some of it? Yes, I actually might. But the poem is called How I Feel About You. Goes, I love you. I can't think of a single reason to say that we don't get along together. Because when we're apart, you still cherish me as a close friend. You still cherish me as a close friend. Give me a second. You could never think of betraying me. You will always be holding my hand. I don't want you to leave me alone. I need you. And then you read it backwards and it's like, I need you to leave me alone. <laughs> I don't want you holding my hand. You will always be betraying me. You could never think of me as a close friend. You still cherish when we're apart because we don't get along together. I can't think of a single reason to say that I love you. 
The water in the hoses they sprayed us with could be the same water that caught us when we jumped ship and held us tight until nothing hurt anymore and buried us where no one could find us again. This dirty water, this muddy water, this bloody water, guilty water, filthy water. Water repeats itself like history. History repeats itself like water. We learn in school that history holds on to a distant past. We're living the same history from decades or even centuries ago, meaning the history coming down on us today is the same history that left so many people without a place to go after Katrina. Is the same history in the rivers the Underground Railroad followed to freedom. The same history in the rivers the Negro speaks of. The same history we wash our curls in. The same history we wade in, that God trouble. The same history left rusted and indigestible in Flint's pipes. The same history they found Emmett Till in. The history in the hoses they sprayed us with is the same history that caught us when we jumped ship and held us tight until nothing hurt anymore and buried us where no one could find us again. This dirty history, this muddy history, this bloody history, guilty history, filthy history. History repeats itself like water, and water repeats itself like history, and learning your history is just as important as drinking water. <laughs> and then I did it, and then I brought it to your attention anyways. Can I get some water? Of course. Yes, you guys hear my voice? Going away? Gatorade? Gatorade doesn't help with throats. That guy's got water. You <laughs> <laughs> want <have> history. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs>
of how I ended up writing this next poem, okay? I was reading a book, and I found a quote in the book, and I thought the quote was so interesting. It was by somebody named Henry Watson, and I was like, that's so cool. Who is that? Why haven't I heard of him? This quote is so good. So I googled him. I put the book down. I put the book away. I don't think I ever touched the book again. <laughs> I was not even halfway through the book. Googled this guy, Henry Watson, found his entire narrative. He was a slave. Okay, I found his entire narrative online. Started reading it, found another quote. I was like, this quote is so cool, and it makes me think of something right away. So I wrote it down. I wrote this quote down. Didn't write down the first quote. Only wrote down the second quote. <laughs> and the second quote, what it said was that there are men, and this is a quote, there are men who do nothing else but hunt fugitive slaves with hounds that are so well trained that they do, as they advertise, take slaves without scarring them enough to injure their value. But did you hear that last bit? To injure their value. Enough to injure their value. That part like really got to me. Because they must have had some really good dog trainers for their time if they could train a dog not to rip off nimble cotton picking fingers. And they could train a dog to know how much force is enough. And they could train a dog not to kill a man just because the future of a country is packed on his shoulders. It's funny. But they could train a hound not to suck the value from a slave, yet we can't stop a man in uniform from pressing his knee into throats, punching the beauty out of faces, firing bullets into craniums in front of small children, and basically destroying any speck of value that could be left in the bodies of the young emancipated, citizenship-wielding, equal, and desegregated black lives that matter just as much as the white or the blue, I guess we've stopped training our hounds. Or maybe we just need to retrain their snouts. They might be following the wrong scent. Don't know what they're looking for. Don't know they ain't still catching runaways. Don't know yet that we've discovered value outside of the nimble cotton picking fingers. I think, I think we should retrain our hounds, but ain't it hard to teach an old dog new tricks? I mean, after all, the one that got Philando Castile was 29, and that's a hell of a lot in dog years. <laughs> Akeem has also been around me too much. <laughs> Akeem has memorized my little pause after in, between in and dog years. He knew exactly how long it was going to be. Too much. <laughs> Not too much. Never too much. <laughs> Well, as my auntie Luther Vandross once said, never too much. <laughs> also, Keith said it just now. Well, as Keith is my auntie too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I'm trying to think of, um, because I'm almost done up here, I'm trying to think if there's anything that Keith didn't say about me in my introduction that would have been, like, important. Um... You're on the board at the... Uh... On the board of what? I don't remember. Uh -huh. But you're on the board of something. It's, uh -huh. Is it South Euclid? Is that the right yes, city? Yes, it's South Euclid. One. One South Euclid. I'm on the board of one South Euclid. The board of directors of one South Euclid. South Euclid's Community Development Corporation. I keep picking up my phone. I told Keith I was going to throw my phone. Oh. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> As promised. I no longer need it. The rest of the poems I'm doing today are in my beautiful brain. 
a beautiful wonky little, speaking of my brain being wonky, speaking of things that I need to bring up in my introduction, it's not like this is just basis level information, but I recently found out that not everyone, and when I say not everyone, I mean like 98% of people don't see static all the time. Apparently it's very, like, so I think I'm, so I found out that I might have a neurological condition because like, like y'all don't see that static? Like it's just, it's just me? Yeah, it's just you. Oh my God. <laughs> my whole life? So yeah, so that's <laughs> one thing about me. I might have this neurological condition called um, visual snow. And I just found that out like not that long ago. And ever since I figured it out, things have been looking crazy. <laughs> are the glasses helping at all? So the glasses are helping me see the static. <laughs> <laughs> so like, playing the glasses. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Can you draw what the static looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because it's over, and like, I, I, I assumed that when I drew that you also saw the static on the drawing already, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just so happy. Y'all don't see that? <laughs> but I added it with static. So, <laughs> yeah, for the past, like, um, my birthday's about to come up, so for the past almost 24 years now. Oh, my birthday. I'll be 24 in about a month. Um, and I feel like that is kind of old. And I'm ancient. I just feel like I'm kind of getting up there. Like I was born in 1998. That's crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. You're like this much off a creaky knee. I know. All the way back in the 20th century. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Oh. I didn't know I was going to do that. So, like, I'm over, I'm over two decades. And, like, I really have a problem with that. Like, I feel like I can't, I can't turn 24 yet because I'm, like, way too young. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Ten, ten year olds gonna die. <laughs> 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 that is so hard. <laughs> I feel like um like there's this checklist of stuff you're supposed to do before you turn twenty-four. And based off that list I'm probably like seventeen. <laughs> or maybe I'm like sixteen. But no that, that actually like really explains why I've never ever not once in the history of everything ever lost a game of never have I ever. Oh. Like I always win really easy. Like if a friend says never have I ever been drunk, most of the circle surrenders one of their fingers, overlapping it with other fingers laid down in defeat in rounds prior. But I, ten fingers standing strong, laugh. Because I'm going to win. And I know it. And I'm a sore winner. So I always look at the circle, proud. And I say, never have I ever seen a pork chop. <laughs> it looks like it after that, I'm usually just really sad. But that's OK, because I win. <laughs> so this is the only game I can win for having such a clean slate. And it's perfect because I never, ever have to worry about dirtying it up as long as I have this game. It's better this way. Because if anything should happen to me, there'll be nothing to slander my name with. Nothing to dig out the dirt. No dirt to dig into in the first place. I stay in line. I keep my head down. I keep my mouth shut. I know how far they'll go to stretch a story wide enough to cover their own ass, to repurpose slight character flaws for a guilt-free narrative. Should I be gunned down tomorrow? May the news headlines paint me beautiful. 
Paint me truth. Paint me in full color, not just in black. Paint me human. May my shooter be villain in my narrative, not hero in their own. May the sound of their name be irrefutably disturbing. Should I be gunned down tomorrow? May you remember my words and know that I do not deserve to die. Know that I've lived each waking moment so deep in fear of bullets that I forgot how to sin. And as you hear my words in this moment, remind yourself that the price for not following orders should never be death. Remind yourself that the price for one small mistake should never, ever be death. Remind yourself that a child, and yes, I said a child, that makes one mistake does not deserve to be shot and shot and shot and shot and shot. And shot and shot. Know that his mother, like every mother, did not deserve to see her son's blood flee his lifeless corpse as he slowly decayed in the middle of the street. He, like you and I, was human and therefore made mistakes. He was 18, but I would trade him my chance to turn 24 if I could. Should I be gunned down tomorrow? Know that I, like anyone else would be, was scared. When they dig up my mistakes that I'm too afraid to admit I have made, remember this poem. Remember I stayed in line the best I could, kept my head down, my mouth shut. Know that I have never ever lost a game of never have I ever. Ten fingers always pointed to the sky. You did it during open mic. <laughs> for, those, for those that aren't here, it'll flow. I'll even do. I'll even do like two really short ones, so that you have time. Did yeah. the microphone just get louder? Yeah, absolutely. I, I might have another thing. See, yeah, look, yeah, everybody, look everybody is supporting Danielle right now. That's right. That's right. So anyone want to get up here and just like dance? <laughs> just like do a little like. Just like, you know what I mean? Like, Ooh, I could do a really bitchy poem. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the spirit. That's what I've been waiting on all night. <laughs> um, I won't do two, I'll just do one. Because I don't think one's boring. Come on. <laughs> Keith wants me to do it. Do whatever you like. But yes, I'd I vote yes. <laughs> all right, well, if it's boring. It's your fault. Right, then I cannot request it next time. Do you guys know the alphabet? I don't know this one. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's like, so like, here we go. A, B, C, D, E. F, G, H. I. J, K. L, M. N, O, P. Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, H, Y, and Z. I know about that. Did you ever hear that? Sounds familiar. No. Anyone? Never. What is that? No. What is that? So this poem, um, how many letters are there? 26? This poem is uh, 26 words long. It's an alphabet poem. So the first word starts with an A, and then the next word starts with a B, and then C? guess what the next word starts with? It starts with a W. <laughs> yeah. This is um, the alphabet as retold by someone who knows nothing lasts forever. 
Another broken chain defines everything finite. Galaxies huddle in jars. Kisses last momentarily. Nothing's owed perpetuality. Quietly rusting stars, tranquilly undone. Violently wasting zenial years, zigzagging. I knew when you were done on that one, too. <laughs> I could follow along. You didn't know about the extra letter that I added. <laughs> what? <laughs> Amberson? <laughs> the next word started with an Amberson. Um, and this last one is my favorite one of my own. I'm going to drink water first. I had an incident, an incident at the University Heights Juneteenth celebration in which I was okay. trying to do this one, and I couldn't because I started coughing. I edited that part out, though. Keith edited it out, <laughs> but the crowd knew. <laughs> the crowd was there. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> and it wasn't just like, a, I was like, <sighs> <laughs> right in the middle of it. And that poem was so pretty, and that cough was so not. So I'm going to make sure, because I do have a little bit of a throat thing right now, so I'll make sure. Wait. <laughs> Delicious history. I was going to say something about history. I was going to call back. Nice. Synergy. Okay. So this is, this, the microphone got louder again. This is crisis writing number 19. There have been a lot of different theories on how the world is going to end because of some man-made catastrophe. Like nukes, or climate change, or coronavirus, but personally I don't like the sound of those. I think they're all just a little too cliche. I think if I had to write the end of the world, I'd have a curious black child running their thumb across the horizon until they found the edge of a smooth strip of tape. And they'd start scraping at it with their nail until it peeled away. And there'd be nothing holding the sky to the earth anymore. And the world would just peel back like the top of a convertible. No flames, no sickness, nothing nefarious, just everything collapsing into our baby's hands. That's a different ending. I, it has different endings sometimes. Nice, I've not heard that one before. All right, so I went to hear Raja at the Tongue and Groove, you're featuring the Tongue and Groove music, poetry jam, poetry music jam. And one of my, because I knew several of these pieces, a lot of these pieces that you're performing, so I knew what you were doing, but it was, Raja has this amazing way of just being in conversation, and you're sitting there knowing the piece, but knowing a lot of people in the audience don't. So I knew she'd already started, but the people in the crowd, a lot of them didn't. She's just talking about herself and, you know, I'm really young. And, like, I know she's already going into the poem. And then you just get that moment where they realize she's already in the middle of the poem. And, like, damn, she's killing it. And you were just, like, it was in between poetry conversation. You did it with water cycles. You did it with hounds. You did it with Never Have I Ever. And it was just a really cool thing to experience just to watch that happen. I didn't want to say that as part of the introduction because I wanted you to feel that. So, um, Danielle. <laughs> What did you say, Akeem? Thank you, anxiety. <laughs> Thank you, anxiety. Akeem, Danielle, so one of you coming back up? Do you want to do something? Danielle, yeah, yeah, Are please. you ready already? I, I got one. All right, Danielle. Ladies and gentlemen, Danielle, Nicole, Nikki Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is one I don't do too much. I uh, haven't figured out all my edits on this one yet. But, uh, I actually, when I wrote this one, 
it's literally a bunch of insecurities I had at different places. You know, when sometimes I show up and feel like an imposter or I feel like, you know, I don't match up with the, the intelligence in the room. I feel like everybody's smarter than me or every poet's better than me or, you know, sometimes I had this imposter syndrome. So I really kind of wrote uh, some inspiration to myself, but I kind of also use it for some of my other poets that might express to me they feel some of the same way or they get all shy about getting up and sharing stuff. And I'm like, if you don't get up there and sit there and share something, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's not that good. And I'm like, you know, so I was speaking to myself. I'm speaking to them. I'm speaking to everybody at the same time. So it's called Show Up for Dope Ass Poets Afraid to Launch. Show up scared, but show up. Show up frayed, ugly, barefaced. Show up inadequate, malnourished. Show up fat. Let your big belly bump people as you try to squeeze by. Let your shame apologize for the space you take up. Show up wearing someone else's face, someone else's clothes, reading someone else's script. Let someone else's shoes be too tight on your feet. Let your dark dogs bark so loud you forget all the lines and scrap the whole facade. Just show up naked, outranked, with your dog-eared notebook full of words, impersonating a poet. Show up sweaty, out of breath, too proud to use your inhaler in front of people. Show up wheezy, show up late. Close the door gently behind you. Slide into the empty space in the back row. Blend into the wallpaper. Let your feet be soft, but your silence too loud. Show up the same color as the pew. Become the pew, not to be seen when the altar call comes, but the altar demands its sacrifice. Today you are lamb. Show up without the homework. Confess your sins that you never read the book. You don't understand the words. Come bearing testimony that bends the respectability politics so low that common folk can reach the branches, eat the fruit, see themselves as God. Show up knowing the applause is not your glory to claim. And though you may never deliver a perfect 30 poem, someone mistakes your bravery for poetry, joins you for that altar call. Today you are the body and the blood, the water and the wine. If they don't catch the Holy Ghost up in here, maybe you could just get them high enough to admit they don't understand the words either. And there is no such thing as a perfect 30 poem. So just bring what you've got. You are God after all, at least for three minutes. Though you may be a God with a bad poem. If the word is with God, then let there be editing. Let there be teachable moments. <laughs> Show up in progress. Showing up has always been your only assignment. The homework is never too late. Where two or more poets show up, a sanctuary appears. Any cup you drink out of is the holy grail. Come as you are, but get here. Show up vulnerable. Show up scared, but show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole piece about that part. <laughs> Akeem, did you want to do the bitchy poem? Did you want me to do it? You must do it. I, I, I think yes. I think the I think general consensus is we would love for you to do it. I mean, you can't like throw that out there and analyze us and then like. I wasn't tantalizing. I just I just was trying to solve for you. <laughs> I was being your friend, okay? I was trying to be. The Rose of this Golden Girls trio. Oh, okay. hey. Yes. I love it when poetry makes me this. Obviously, I am the VR. <laughs> Raja is obviously the Rose. Well, who's Blanche then? The one with kids is Blanche. <laughs> To the men who used to like me. <laughs> you don't like me anymore. 
And honestly, I prefer you that way. To say your love was inadequate would be to first admit that it was love at all. Somehow you don't believe you were a prison sentence, despite how pretty you are. A cage is a cage, whether it traps a heart or a man, and you will never know freedom because your life is captivity. Beautiful, obsessed with his own reflection, man. It would be too easy to compare you to the Greek god of narcissism, but even I am not dramatic enough to exaggerate you into a god. You are not a god, you are barely a man. You are so committed to immaturity. You know every path and never land. You are no Peter Pan, just a lost boy. You do not give main character, just a side dish I desperately tried to make a steak out of. But even my vegan ass is not vegan enough to make main courses out of side dudes. You salad eater broccoli boy, green and messy when you cut him off. It is not that I never cared for you. Not that I never loved you. I did. I just don't have it on me right now. I take all of myself back. All the love I have in my life starts with me and I will make sure it ends with me too. You walked away and took no pieces of me. I am whole. The few dollars I spent were worth it when your smile lit the living room in my chest. But trust me, a few dollars is what you are worth. Now, I'm not calling you a cheap whore, but if the check fits, take that to the bank and cash it. I'm not angry. I have love for you. Again, I just don't have it on me right now, the way you never had your wallet any time we went out. I did care for you. I just don't care now. I love myself more than any head ache. You were an expert in as if it were the only skill you mastered. I don't hate you. You're not worth that energy. And you don't deserve hatred. Shade, yes, but hatred I hope for your own sake that you grow. Just not in my garden, with my soil, with my water, and my green, green leaves anymore. I have so much more for me now that the weeds are gone. I really thought you were a flower dandelion, and maybe one day you will be. Oh, and P.S. Use less teeth, babe. As difficult as it was for you to keep your mouth shut, I'm sure you can figure this one out. <laughs> <laughs> that was worth bringing you back up. So thank you, sir. Thank you all for coming out. If you like what this was about tonight, please feel free to come back again. We'd love to have you. Tell a friend. I do have flyers about this event, and I have little mini things about the uh, one at the Kenmore Library. Feel free to take some with you. You've got a place. If you need it to remember, we've got a place you can put it up to tell other people. Thank you so much to Seth, amazing Seth and Nate throughout the theater. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael, for having two of you here for us tonight. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Disperse. 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 <laughs>